So, actually, uh, speaking to this august audience, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Second of all, how many of you have ever published before? Yeah, I figured quite a few. Okay, keep your hands down, you people. Okay, now, how many of the rest of you think you have a book in you? Oh, yeah, these are my people. These are my people. Okay, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of books, what companies like Blurb are doing about it, and how we enable everyone in this audience who has something to say to get your work out there. Okay, a great way to do that is to tell you a bit of my story. Um, this is me, the sartorial splendor of what is up with the hoodie tied under the neck and then open. <laughs> And, and did, you, did you notice the socks with the hush puppies? I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I, show you this, I show you this photograph because my dad took this photograph of me when I was eight years old. And what is so fascinating about this is I think we were the most photographed family in the United States of America. Um, and I really developed my love of photography from him. I, I became fascinated with photography. At the age of 11, my parents are both British, and at the age of almost 12 years old, I was sent over to London um, to stay with my dad's sister for a year. And he gave me a Kodak Retina camera, which is an actual film-based camera back in the day. And you had to actually load the film, and you actually had to understand things like ASA and shutter speed and aperture. And I was terrified by this camera. I was so afraid I was gonna break it. But one day, I went out with my aunt and uncle, and we went to Cambridge, and I took a photograph that I thought surely should make the cover of the National Geographic. It was awful. It, it was so trite. It was swans under a tree, and I thought it was brilliant. And my dad sent it back to me, and he sent me a letter that said, okay, I want to explain the rule of thirds to you. Like, I'm 11. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. How about at a girl? It's so great. But the rule of thirds was really my first step into the world of photography. And many years later, after I'd been CEO of two other startups, that's another story, um, and sold my second one, which is really another story, because I am not indeed retired to the villa in the south of France, um, I started photographing again. And I decided to photograph fellow entrepreneurs that I had built companies with. And along the way, they would tell me their stories. And their stories were fascinating. And I realized what started out as a personal project really wasn't personal at all. It was a community project. And I'm a crazy person. I would spend five hours making a single print. And what I decided to do was I thought, well, I wanted to share this back with this community of people. And I thought, well, how's the best way to do that? And I thought, well, I could make prints for everybody. That would take me really the rest of my natural life. And, and really actually. And, and then I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I thought, okay, I'll make a book. How hard can that be? Well, I realized it was very difficult indeed. And the reason why it was so difficult was because I very quickly learned that books were actually things of commerce. And I wanted to make a book as a gift for about 40 people who were the subjects of the book. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. You know, I know people, right? I mean, I'm in Silicon Valley. I've been CEO of two other companies. Uh, desktop publishing meets a back-end e-commerce system, meets digital printing. I was printing at home in my digital darkroom. Really, why is this not possible? And I realized that what has been happening is that the yoking in the publishing industry of the qualitative and the economic meant that really, unless you had very deep pockets, the only people whose work got published were people whose work was of significant commercial value. Because, uh, because publishers are like VC for author, like venture capital for authors. They take all the risk, they choose some winners, and they put the work out there and hope, it's portfolio theory, that a few of them really make it big, most of them won't, and a few of them will be sadly on the remainder shelf. And I thought, well, come on there must be an opportunity for a technology play here that would enable everybody to make a proper book, a really beautiful book. But I had three questions for myself. The first one is, you know, am I the only person in the universe whose work is not going to sell through 
40, 50,000, 10,000, even 5,000 copies who would like to make a book? And the answer to that was, of, you know, of course. In fact, the year that we launched Blurb was the year that um, digital cameras eclipsed the sale of film-based cameras. So all of a sudden, all of us had mountains of digital content that we wanted to put in a book for any reason or no reason. The second was, could we make money on a book of one? This turned out to be the seminal business model question for our business. Because if we could make money on the book of one copy from a title, everyone in the world could be a publisher. If you had the princely sum of $10 and access to the internet, you could publish your own book. And I thought that that was really revolutionary. So we set on a path to figure out how to do that. <laughs> and then I thought, oh crap, what if people steal content from other people? What if we're violating copyright? And if we are successful, we will be producing hundreds of thousands of titles, and we can't possibly look at every one. How's that going to work? And I knew no venture capitalist would give us a dime if they had any prospect of all of their funds walking out the door in the first lawsuit. But there was this thing called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which, uh, which passed in 1998 that basically absolved people like us from really deep liability. So yay on that one, moved forward, got funded. Okay, then I had my John McEnroe moment. <laughs> because I'm looking at the publishing industry, because I'm, I, you know, I'm a stu I don't know anything about publishing. I mean, I'm a software en entrepreneur. And I thought, well, I've got to figure out how this works, right? So I walk around and I felt like, and you guys who are, any of you are tennis fans, know John McEnroe to be the guy who keeps saying, you cannot be serious, right? <laughs> uh, the more I learned about how this industry worked in their business model, I thought, man, I have hit a bonanza here. <laughs> and, and I had no idea, but I thought this is really ripe for disruption. So uh, onward we went. Now we got funded, we're on to the, off to the races, all is good. We figure out how to make beautiful printed books. And by the way, highly illustrated books. So if David McCauley is still in the room, we'd love to have a chat. Um, anyway, uh, so here we are. And we knew ebook was coming because, in fact, that's how I got the company funded in the first place, was because there was going to be this disruption. But what happened was, and I, I learned some things that I want to share with you. The first one is that whenever there's a new thing that comes around, a new technology, we tend to, to immediately uh, uh, call out the death of the old, right? But then what tends to happen is that we all resuscitate that previous thing, and, and perhaps with even greater love, albeit in smaller numbers, because we come to appreciate the highest and best use of the thing that came before may not indeed be served in the same way with the thing that's come latest. Yeah. So I realized, wow, okay, print is here to stay because it has different affordances and different capabilities than ebooks. But we live in a world of yes, not either or, but both are good. And so we, we really adopted this perspective. And to share that, I want to share a, a couple of stories with you, a couple of actual use cases um, that we see back at the ranch that I thought were very interesting. And the first one is about physicality. And many of you who love physical books will talk, of, and myself included uh, here, although I, I do both, um, will talk about you know, the lovely physical feel, the tactile feel of the paper, maybe even the smell of the paper, just the weight of it in your hands, that you can see it on the desk. I remember when Steve Jobs' uh, biography came out, the Walter Isaacson book. Of course, I downloaded it with homage to my iPad and read it there. <laughs> and then I thought, I didn't see it. I didn't see the book. I actually knew the guy who took the photograph on the back cover jacket, and I never saw the, the jacket of the book. So, of course, I went out and bought a print copy in addition to my digital copy. And it sat on my desk for a year because I just wanted to see it. And that was very interesting to me. And so I sort of observed that. The second really interesting thing happened a few years ago. And this is a story of Craig Maud, if, if any of you know Craig. He's a, he's a designer, very interesting guy, um, book lover. He was living in Japan. 
He moved back to the United States as the designer of Flipboard's um, mobile interface for the phone. And so he's designing this interface with this team of software engineers in Silicon Valley. And at the end of this project, they have their like ta-da moment, like, yay, we shipped. And of course, after you ship, typically there's also a moment where you do some sort of convening of what worked, what didn't work, what did we do, etc. And he talked about this on his blog. And I'm reading his blog because I follow this guy. And I'm reading the story of how they convened in this room. And there's like eight or ten guys in Palo Alto. And they're all standing around the table. And there's this little iPhone in the middle of the table. And they, it felt very empty. Like we spent ten months and, you know, this is, this is what we have. Right? This little thing, right? And, and people felt kind of, we did all that work, right? But where's the evidence of the work? And so Craig left that meeting and apparently a week or so later, he rolls in with this. And what this is, is he, this is a quote from his blog, he pulls from this bag, this gigantic book. It's one foot by one foot square. He convenes this team in this conference room and drops it with a thud on the table. By the way, the thing weighed eight pounds. And there was this rush of all these guys flipping through the pages of a physical book, the people who had just built the interface for the mobile edition of Flipboard, I mean, I just thought, wow, that's a full circle right there, right? That was really interesting. So book as evidence, book as occupying physical space turns out to be a very important thing. Books also uh, in physical, I'm gonna talk to E in a moment, but physical are often objects of great beauty. I mean, David McCauley's work, that was so beautiful. I want to look at that all the time. I want to turn those, I want to see the six foot thing. I want, to, I want that whole thing. And so oftentimes physicality matters when the physicalness, the tactile nature of the very object is intrinsic to the value of the content inside the book. And so these are the things that we didn't know when we started. We just learned them along the way from actual people making books. Okay, now I want to talk about digital because digital is awesome. I mean, I, I have a Kindle. I have every Kindle, every, I have every nook, I have every everything, right? So I have to test them all. And I must have a bajillion, I don't even know how many, how many books I have in the cloud. I'm a voracious reader. Uh, the earlier David this morning talked about the Great Books Program. In addition to my father being a photographer, my mother was an English professor and taught great books. And I started to go to great, great books when I was in second grade. And I've been in more book groups than I can recount. So I am a dedicated, diehard, photographic and book lover, right? And, and yet here I am with this little Kindle reading all these books and I think, is this heresy? It's not heresy because it's convenient, it's awesome, it's immediate, it's like fast food for me, right? <laughs> it's just really fast and I just really love that. And, and if, if, if a physical book is kind of like slow food meant to be savored, maybe consuming books on, a, on an e-reader of some kind is a little bit more akin in the, in the best possible way of, of healthy fast food, of, of fast food. And, and so I have a couple stories to tell here too. One in particular, and this is a well-known filmmaker whose book is not yet done, so I'm not gonna tell you his name because I want him to have his, his moment. But when we first started building out eBooks and we first started seeing them, first they were just, you know, a, like, a, like the, a, a, a replica of a printed book, you know, for fiction and nonfiction titles, not terribly interesting. And then people like us, and our, you know, I'll raise my hand on this one too, we got sort of enamored with the technology aspects of the eye candy affordances that could be made available to you via uh, rich media, right? And, and it was kind of like flash back in the day. It was, not, it was not intrinsic to the book itself. But more recently, we have started working with some people who really want to take that one step farther, and it's kind of how we build um, products today. We're an agile, oh, we're an agile shop. So, so we're working with this one filmmaker, and here's his idea. He has access to assets from one of the world's most iconic movies ever made. And, and he gives lectures. And his lectures are usually an hour long and can't possibly capture 
what he has learned as a filmmaker over the many years. So what he's going to do is he's going to marry the lecture in with the assets from this film and basically deconstruct the movie almost frame by frame from a director's point of view, where you will see, you'll see the opening credits, you'll hear the opening music, and his text in the book will be describing, almost in a scholarly fashion, why those choices were made and why they were brilliant choices. And this book is really designed to be for people who want to make films. But what was fascinating to us is it was books as lecture, books as an event. You could even imagine a version of that book being subscribed to where maybe he convenes people in real time to interact around this content in the book. And we thought that is really, that is accretive. That is really, really interesting. So, I'm going to conclude my remarks by, at the beginning, I asked the question, you know, you know do books matter? And, and I'll just posit a thesis, and that is, in a world of so much abundance, the filter is the value. And when you think about what a book is, a book is the most awesomely cr crafted, curated filter that probably history has ever known. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Thank you very much.